Hi, good afternoon. I'd like to thank the organizers for allowing us to come and present our story. We've had a, quite a transitional year uh, at Abiona Therapeutics, and uh, we're looking forward to sharing with you today some of our story and really where we're going over the next year. So this is our forward-looking statement. Abiona is a publicly traded company on the NASDAQ exchange. Our mission is to uh, develop and deliver gene therapy and plasma-based products for severe and life-threatening diseases. And we have a number of products in our pipeline, both gene therapy and plasma-derived. And uh, to discuss some of our, um, our lead products, we have two gene therapy products that are for the treatments of San Filippo syndromes type A and type B. These are AAV9 products, uh, which is the only serotype uh, that is able to cross the blood-brain barrier endogenously. And following on with that, we have a program in our juvenile batten disease for the treatment of CLN3, uh, also an AAV9. Uh, looking ahead, we have uh, just released um, a press release that we have just licensed another technology for the treatment of Fanconi anemia, um, which also now enables us to treat a number of other blood disorders um, using the CRISPR-Cas9 system. And then towards the end, we'll talk just for a few minutes about our salt diafiltration process, which is a patented process uh, in differentiating from the cone process. Uh, it gives us about tenfold uh, higher yield for different um, uh, plasma-derived proteins. And our initial indications there are for the treatment of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and for um, also purifying IVIG for autoimmune disorders. So in 2014, we completed a number of our pre-IND and recombinant DNA advisory committee filings uh, for both MPS3A and 3B. Uh, we've received our orphan product designations and also the rare pediatric disease uh, designations for both programs, which is an important step and a prerequisite en route to the PRV. Uh, we have also executed worldwide licenses for juvenile batten disease for the treatment of Fanconi anemia using the CRISPR system out of the University of Minnesota. And uh, certainly now um, another uh, AAV platform uh, out of Stanford for the treatment, um, really for the AAV vector to use for the CRISPR-Cas9 program. And when we look ahead uh, through 2015 or 2016, uh, we're very near term on our clinical program for both MPS 3A and 3B and on track to start enrolling those patients uh, uh, December to the first quarter of, this, of 2016. Uh, we're also moving our trials overseas uh, for the treatment of MPS 3A and 3B in the EU and in Australia. Uh, we're also expanding um, our, and validating our uh, SDF alpha, uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin, for validation and characterization to start a registration trial in the second half of 2016. So to talk for a moment about our, our gene therapy programs, our, our lead programs target rare lysosomal storage disorders. There are over 60 types of these lysosomal storage diseases. Uh, there's a deficiency in a singular cellular enzyme that results in the inability to break down GAGs or sugars. Um, these kids, uh, you can see a, a cell, a normal cell on the left, um, and a cell on the right that is an affected cell uh, with that lysosomal storage disease. You can see that this uh, actually becomes a, much like an episode of hoarders where the sugars uh, are, are, are um, continue to accumulate in the lysosomes and not able to be broken down. Uh, age of onset is between the ages of two and six for San Filippo, or five and 10 for juvenile batten disease. These are progressive severe neurological disorders. They have aggressive behavior, seizures, loss of speech. Um, they have inability to sleep and over 70% of these uh, children do not reach the age of 18. Um, Treatments for comparable diseases are very expensive on a yearly basis, and there are no approved treatments for uh, these particular therapy for these diseases. Originally, we were funded and founded by over a dozen international foundations with a mandate to find and fund some of what they thought was the best hopes for their children. So from our foundations in Spain, Switzerland, Canada, Mexico, Australia, and certainly the United States, we have broad patient adoption um, that they're ready to receive a gene therapy, much like many of the other gene therapy companies in this space. And so what are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to do a whole body treatment using an intravenous injection. Uh, it's, uh, lysosomal storage diseases affect all organs in the body. Uh, primarily, there are profound CNS deficits, but they do have liver, um, liver problems, uh, joint, muscle, eye problems, depending on the disease. But there's certainly a, a wide range of peripheral manifestations. And so we're using the AV9 virus to deliver by an intravenous injection for a whole body correction. And our preclinical studies have been very robust. Uh, the researchers at the Nationwide Children's Hospital have uh, been working on this for a dozen years, um, and a number of preclinical models of both the disease and for a number of safety and animal studies, uh, both in wild-type animals and non-human primates. 
We've seen increased enzyme activity, uh, normalized gag content, cor complete correction of neuromuscular function, cognitive improvement, and 100% improvement in survival. And we've looked in both young animals, okay, or juvenile in the four to six week old, but also the more clinically relevant four to six month old animals. And we've also looked in non-human primates for safety. And so delivery of um, the, you know, the virus by intravenous injection, you know, we're using the AV9, as is broadly known, it crosses the blood-brain barrier. It's a single injection um, given once, uh, so it's broad therapeutic expression in cells. Um, we've been able to demonstrate superphysiological enzyme concentration for over a year um, in adult animals. Uh, we're also using and trying to build the best vectors for these programs. So we're using the self-complementary vector, which persists as an episome, and the self-complementary vectors, you know, give 10 to 100 fold more uh, expression in the cells, and this is important for cross correction in the lysosomal storage field. Uh, I enjoy showing this particular slide. Uh, you know, we end up getting a lot of questions about the potential for an IV delivery to cross the blood brain barrier. And here we see uh, in a juvenile batten mouse model. Uh, this is an animal that, a mouse that was given uh, an injection at about one month of age, and this is five months post injection using a self complementary AV9 expressing GFP. And so here what you see is uh, wherever there's green uh, in the slide, on the left-hand part of the slide, that's where the virus was able to get into the CNS and express um, the GFP marker. So you can see here broad, uniform, and very robust expression five months post-injection. And this, you know, correlates, again, I'll draw your attention to the bottom line here. This is the, you know, vector dose uh, looking at, you know, 2e to the 13th, which is very much in range with many of the other groups out there. Looking at older animals in the four to six month range, um, you can see that 16 to 27 months post-injection, we see 500 to 1500 percent increase in enzyme activity in the brain. And this is of wild type levels. This is not over baseline. This is the percent of wild type. So certainly... Um, looking at this, you know, we do see a large amount of, of CNS expression for a very long period of time post-injection. And this is important because, you know, you want to look what type of, just because you have enzyme activity, you need to demonstrate that there is some level of biopotency and effect. Uh, here we're seeing um, complete clearance of the lysosomal gags. So looking in the liver, the spleen, heart, kidney, lungs, and of course in the brain, where you can see a complete normalization of gag tissue at slightly below what we're considering to be our minimum efficacious dose. Importantly, uh, that, that increased enzyme activity and reduction of GAGs has um, behavioral and cognitive effects. So this, is a, on the, uh, this graph shows uh, the hidden task in a water maze. So these are animals that are tested. It's a cognitive function. Um, you can see, I'll draw your attention to the days of testing. It's four consecutive days. After day four, again, you can see that the animals have learned how to escape um, and get on top of the, of the, the hidden platform. Similarly, this is a neuromuscular test, the uh, rotorod test. These are animals, the blue bars are the unaffected animals, the gray bars are the affected animals, and then the green and black bars are treated animals, so higher bars are better on the graph on the right. So again, after two days of testing, you can see complete um, correction of neuromuscular function. And this is probably the actual graph that, that brought me over to the company a few years ago was really the normalization of survival. So you can see here this gray bar, uh, this is um, affected animals. You know, they all die by the age of, t by about 12 months. Okay, and when you look at, um, these are animals treated with one injection at about one month of age. These effects last two and a half years. So the blue line is the unaffected animals, the green and black are the treated animals. So you see a complete correction of survival. And when you, again, you keep in mind that 70% of these kids don't reach the age of 18, this, if it translates into the clinic, would be a tremendous, um, tremendous uh, to the parents. And so to prepare for our clinical trials for both MPS3A, working with our partners Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio, uh, they've uh, been enrolling a natural history study. And as we have seen throughout the field, natural history studies have played an important uh, role in FDA approvals and FDA feedback on how they're looking at treatments for rare disease. So we believe that this is a strong competitive advantage for us uh, going, in, going into the clinical trials. And so they've enrolled 25 subjects. Um, they've had study assessments through uh, at 0, 6, and 12 months, looking at a number of uh, parental rating assessments, some neurocognitive exams, some motor tests, certainly standard, standard laboratory assays, uh, GAG assessments, um, MRIs going to be very important for us in the trials. 
And so all of the subjects at this point are through one year of follow-up, which we believe, um, and a report will be coming out on this later this year or the beginning of next year from Nationwide, that this really has supported our clinical endpoints and has helped validate them going into the INDs. And so as we look to our global enrollment, uh, we're trying to do, we're starting the trials in, in, at Nationwide uh, and moving to Spain and Australia in the second half of 2016. Uh, to move along, we also have a, a CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing program, and uh, you know, you've heard much of that here today and yesterday, so I don't need to go into a lot of detail. Uh, we do have a CRISPR-Cas9 for rare blood diseases. Uh, we're working on first and second generation products from both an ex vivo and what I believe is uh, the holy grail, which is be an in vivo approach. So um, stay tuned for how we're approaching that. Uh, our first indication is for Fanconi anemia, which is, again, another rare pediatric autosomal uh, recessive disease. Um, and that this, this technology is coming out of the University of Minnesota from Jacob Tolar and uh, is um, reinforced with IP from Stanford, as you've heard in the talk earlier today. And so our ABO 301, uh, we're getting in front of the FDA uh, regulatory meetings later this year. Uh, it's still preclinical, uh, but we look forward to sharing that story next year. So to summarize, you know, any of our preclinical data summary, uh, we have IV delivery for our three lead products in San Filippo type A and B and for juvenile bat disease. Looking at mice treated at um, ages one through six months with an intravenous single injection of, of the vector uh, led to complete restoration of enzyme activity, reduction of gags, and this led, of course, to cognitive improvements, improvements in neuromuscular function, and complete survival. Um, and we've tested this from a safety standpoint uh, in normal mice and non-human primates. And, uh, you know, we have, um, uh, we'll on, on track for both our MPS3A and 3B programs to treat in December or January. So now looking at our plasma-derived technologies, uh, we have uh, an S the SDF-alpha for the first one is alpha protease inhibitor. Uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is a rare recessive disorder. Um, it, it, a deficiency produces COPD. Uh, it's a protein folding disease. Uh, we're certainly um, excited about this particular platform. Uh, our process is tenfold more efficient than the cone process, which really hasn't been modified since uh, the 1940s. Uh, it's a billion dollar market with a combined annual growth of 20%. Uh, it's reimbursed at 100,000 per year. And, and currently we believe that it, um, there's a large amount of patients that are undiagnosed and a shortage in the market of alpha-1 protease inhibitor um, and so we are excited to be uh, working on that program. Uh, we, the registration pathway uh, is a bioequivalence study. Uh, it's a single pivotal study that will start in the second half of 2016. We'll be looking with primary endpoints to demonstrate PK and antigenic or functional, um, that, it's not in, in, that it's not inferior to an approved active comparator. Uh, it's a pretty standard study looking, again, at 50 subjects uh, with lung disease and AT, A1AT deficiency. So looking at our milestones, uh, again, we have um, made a lot of progress in the past year. We went through a reverse merger and are now public, uh, which has been very exciting for us as a transition, has allowed us to help accelerate our global development of these programs. Uh, we've raised over $60 million in the past nine months um, to help us um, move these programs uh, into the worldwide development. And again, uh, as we look to 2015, that we have two INDs that we believe will help us uh, stay on track for uh, 2000 and, uh, end of enrollments at the end of 2015, 2016. Uh, we're going to uh, submit to the GMO and ethical committees uh, in the EU. Uh, that's ongoing and believed to be completed by December. Uh, we're expanding these clinical trials into Europe and Australia, and we're going to have uh, the SDF Alpha, um, the process scallop we've finished in the next few months and anticipating that that will go into clinical trials in the second half of 2016. And so again, that'll be a registration study and we hope a BLA filing. As a financial summary, um, you know, we have approximately 37 million fully diluted shares outstanding. Uh, we have no debt currently on the books. So as a summary, uh, we, we believe that we're a high value added rare disease gene therapy pipeline. We have a number of lead products uh, to treat lysosomal storage diseases, three different programs going to three countries in 2016. We also are developing a CRISPR-Cas9 developed um, using an AAV, and we have the SDF Alpha program. Um, and so we have broad intellectual property, and our first patients are expected to be enrolled very soon. And with that, I'll thank you.